Good morning, church. What a powerful song. I am no longer a slave to fear. You know, at different points, at different times in our lives, we have that feeling that we're not sure what's going to happen. Now, you look at this title and you go, Celebrating the End of the World, and some of you are like, oh, I kind of know where he's going with this. I kind of know he's going to be talking about communion. I mean, it's not something we talk about celebrating. We celebrate engagements. We celebrate birthdays. Thank you for that. Well, speaking of fear, Sylvia did tell me that, you know, well, she didn't tell me. She says, I want to do the Living His Love part, which is our church segment part, so you don't worry about it. And she had this, you know, but I uh, just appreciate, appreciate the love. So thank you, Grandma, for the well wishes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mom and Dad told me to be kind to the elderly. So let's move on to our sermon for today. Communion and the second coming is in the, in inexplicably linked together. We are in part four of our Pictures of Faith series. So once we come to part five, what we're going to do is we're actually going to um, kind of give you a bit of a summary uh, from each week as we go forth from there. But today, I want to get straight into it. So I'm going to kneel as I would like to normally do. Uh, as we pray, feel free to stay seated. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you and praise you, Lord, for the blessings of life, for the blessings of freedom to worship as we are able to do here today. But as we um, look at two very important topics, um, two very important principles that you've given to us, Lord, as we uh, open your word, may you not just open our minds, but may you open our hearts as well. Hide the messenger behind the message and behind the cross of Calvary that any and all glory comes back to you and you alone. We thank you. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, communion, what we call Holy Communion, or you would have heard the term ordinances, is celebrated once a year, uh, once a quarter rather, here in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, some call it the Lord's Supper, and I want to give you, I guess, the dictionary definition according to um, the biblical interpretation. I, I guess it's a summary. It's a number of Bible verses, but part of our fundamental beliefs, the 28, one of them describes what the Lord's Supper actually is. If you want to look at the actual number, it's number 16. The numbers probably don't matter as much. This just happened to be falling under number 16. It says this. The Lord's Supper is the participation in the emblems, and what emblems actually means is the symbols. So in this case, the bread and the wine. In the emblems of the body and blood of Jesus, as an expression of faith in Him, our Lord and Savior. In this experience of communion, Christ is present to meet and strengthen His people. As we partake, we joyfully proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. Preparation for the supper includes self-examination, repentance, and confession. The Master ordained the service of foot washing to signify renewed cleansing, to express a willingness to serve one another in Christ-like humility, and to unite our hearts in love. The communion service is open to all believing Christians. So what we do here at the Adventist Church is a little bit different than communion in other churches because we have this thing called foot washing. And what that really means is, according to John chapter 13, it's a sign of humility where we are serving each other. But a core essence of communion is actually in this uh, highlighted bit here. We joyfully proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. So the second coming is literally in the Seventh-day Adventist name. We call ourselves Seventh-day Adventist Christians because we are looking forward to the, the Advent, which means the coming. You look excited. Maybe because we've kind of been distracted, and it's very easy to be distracted by what happens here. And maybe it's easy to forget what that actually means. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not implying in any way that we should just live as if we've got nothing to live for in this world. Certainly, that is not the case. Certainly, I don't live that way. But I think with all the distractions of the world, um, we can simply lose sight of what is to come. I want to share a little bit more about that, but consider how, I guess, the Christian world in general 
portrays the coming of Jesus and the end of the world. Prepare for the end of this world. And people are out there with flyers. And on top of that, they say things like, God saves from hell because the end of the world is coming and you are going to, if you don't, you know. God is, the, is, is angry with the wicked every day. The end is near. The king returns May 21st, 2011. Some of you will remember Harry Camping. Um, so he, Harold Camping rather, so he predicted that the world was going to end on May 21st, and then he had a couple of other predictions. May, uh, October 21st was the, other, was the other date. He spent $100 million telling the world that the world was going to end. I remember hearing about it uh, 2011. I was in a bus with some, uh, uh, some friends, actually, in May. Um, and it was May 23rd, I think it was. So we were just talking, oh, by the way, is the world supposed to end yet? <laughs> oh, yeah, two days ago. And we just laughed and we just continued. There's this perspective that the end of the world, um, we lose sight of what it means. And Hollywood has kind of shaped the end of the world on the other side of things. Some of you may have uh, watched this movie. I have, and I, looked, I saw bits and pieces of it. There was a really really troubling scene because Will Smith is the only person left in the world and him and his dog and everything else, everyone else had been turned into zombies. That's a movie you should watch, right? Um, so in 2012, this movie was released in 2007 or 2006, so he says in 2012 the world is going to end, it's going to be an apocalyptic sort of a thing. In, speaking of 2012, there was also another movie literally called 2012 where the world supposedly ended, the crust of the earth was becoming unstable, and it was inspired by true events based on the Mayan calendar. Um, and they built arcs to escape the cataclysm. Hollywood has been trying to paint this picture for a very long time. Some of you remember this. Two movies that came out at the same time about a giant asteroid that was going to come and destroy the earth. And, and one movie, Deep Impact, had this dramatic scene, oceans rise. Not the song that we sing, but cities fall. And there's this dramatic, you know, close-up of faces of people just, you know, and all that. Obviously, I'll keep my day job. But at the end of the day, the end of the world picture has a really apocalyptic feel to it, to the point where, the, what do you want to celebrate? And it doesn't help when as Christians, we paint the end of the world in going to heaven as something like this, where we are literally sitting on clouds, playing the harp, blah, 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 Forever. So when we sell it as that, what's there to celebrate? Now, friends, this could not be further from the truth. Silver shared a verse last week. I want to pick up on that. Um, in essence, you could almost say this forms the, 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 the basis of our entire series. It's found in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. We kind of uncover some of the heresies, so to speak, of what people think the Bible is. The, the, Bible, God says that, uh, the Bible says that God is love, according to 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. It's not so much that God is loving, or He loves, but God is love. So in the context of that, we should probably look at the second coming, a communion, and we're going to tie it all together based on that principle, and more importantly, based on what the Bible says. I'm going to fire some Bible verses to you relatively quickly. And once again, I'm happy to share my notes. Um, some of you will be familiar with some of these verses. But I want to share, throw some of the, uh, these at you relatively quickly. In Matthew 24 and verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of age? Uh, the end of the age. So Jesus here is talking to his disciples, and they asked him, What's going to happen when the world ends? And Jesus says, Well, here's a couple of things you should know. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. So one of the very first signs is people claiming to be Jesus. They will deceive many. But um, in verse 24 of Matthew 24, 
For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So in other words, there's this admonition that don't believe everything you, say and you see and hear. Just don't believe it. Even if it's the pastor telling you, unless the pastor points you to the word of God, just kind of don't believe it. Because especially in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. So that's why all of these guys that talk about the end of the world, supposedly, purportedly to be Christians, deny Jesus' love and are literally destructive heresies. Some of you may remember this guy. And I remember David Koresh back in 1993 in Waco, Texas. He was actually, some of you may not know this, he was actually brought up as a Seventh-day Adventist. Hmm. Did you know that? Some of you know that? A lot of you are nodding your hands. Um, by the way, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor for a reason. I believe in our mission. I believe in our message. And I believe um, in what we do as a whole to try and preach the gospel. I believe, obviously, in the sovereignty of the Bible and to... Uh, focus on that alone, but at the end of the day, membership in a church does not guarantee you anything at all. It is a relationship with Jesus that will. The story of David Koresh is actually very interesting. He was fighting for leadership for for the Branch Davidians. The Branch Davidians is a splinter group from Shepherd's Rod who was disfellowshipped from the Seventh-day Adventist church back in like the 1920s and 1930s. Now, uh, it's interesting because George Roden was the other guy who was challenging uh, David Koresh. And they both claimed to be prophets. And so the challenge was to raise the dead. I mean, that's, that's one way of proving your leadership, right? So David Koresh says, sure, but to do that, we need a body. You can see where I'm going with this, right? So David Koresh says, you know what? You go first. So George Roden says, fine, I'll dig up a body, I'll exhume the body. He dug it up, and what David Koresh did was David Koresh called the cops on George and got him arrested for digging up the body and disturbing the gravesite. <laughs> There's many other crazy stories out there about this guy, but at the end, in 1993, the FBI stormed the compounds of Waco, Texas. Um, David Koresh and 79 of his followers were killed. 79. You may think, that sound, this guy sounds crazy. This guy predicts the end of the world. What? Oh, wow. Simone is saying she actually had friends that died there. I, I did not know that. You know, at the end of the day, the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Church, I cannot emphasize the importance of having your own walk with God. I cannot emphasize that enough. As a church pastor, as church pastor Sylvia and I, we will do our best. But I challenge you to get to know Jesus for yourself. What we do is we paint pictures of faith, pictures of God. But it's up to you to take that relationship personally. There's one other thing. I want to move on. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. I'm going to change the pace just a little bit now. The Bible says knowledge shall increase. Um, you can just look up facts now, um, but I want to give you some, some quick statistics. The world population is about 7.7 .7 billion right now, 7.6, 7.7 billion. Do you know how many internet users there are in the world right now? Do you want to guess? Not quite 6.5 billion. 4.27 billion internet users around the world, okay? 2.25 billion active Facebook users. 1.69 uh, billion websites. 2.81 million emails per second. Just under 80,000 YouTube videos viewed per second. And... 
today, or yesterday, I guess if you count one day, there were 71 million photos uploaded to Instagram in one day. This side of the church probably contributed about 80,000 of them. I don't know. It's interesting. The Bible says that knowledge will increase. If you look at how the internet, the use of the internet has increased over the last few years, if you want to go back, just say eight, nine, nine years, it's 1.6, 1.96 billion, so it's double. You go back five years before that, it's 888 million. You go back five years before that, oh, I gave it away, 304 million. You go to, you go to 1995, it's only 16 million. It's almost increasing like an exponential rate, and technology has come so far that we literally have information and knowledge at our fingertips. Literally. You know, some of you have noticed this. I put my references down at the bottom because I have seen situations where people quote stuff, and within the same minute of quoting, somebody has already looked it up and said, that's wrong. Knowledge will increase. The Bible isn't quite done. Matthew chapter 24. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. You know, I, can, I, was, I actually had a list of everything that's happened, um, but it, it's not hard to find. The news is there. Um, just look at the front page of the news, you know. There are 815 million people today who go hungry every day right now. 815 million. More than one in ten, one in nine. I remember reading a statistic back in 2013. I should have saved the web page or the document. But um, out of the 815 million, I don't know how many people were hungry then. Um, the World Food Program says that, this is 2013, there were 66 million school-aged children who go hungry every day. So 66 million who go hungry every day, back in 2013, the World Food Program. School-aged children. And to feed these children for a year, it was going to cost $3.2 billion. Okay? They're like, oh, that's, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. $3.2 billion to feed 66 million school-aged children who, are, who go hungry every day. But I also read from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government report in 2013. Also, I don't have to put it up here. You can find that quite easily. The war in Afghanistan and Iraq cost anywhere between four to six trillion dollars. So $3.2 billion, a lot of money to, f to feed all those hungry kids for a, f for a full year. But if the U.S. had not gone to war, they could have literally fed these kids for a thousand years. One trillion equals 1,000 billion, if you're wondering. It's kind of depressing, isn't it, when you think about the state of world situation, the, the world that is in. Some of these words, some of you might be able to relate to straight away. What life is like. Heartache, betrayal, loss, sickness, sorrow, loneliness, pain, disappointment, death of a loved one, anguish, depression. What is there to celebrate? Sorry, guys. <laughs> it gets better. It does. First of all, Jesus promises this. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill. And to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. So Jesus is saying, hey, the world situation isn't that great, but this is not a sermon altogether. But you can have life abundantly here. You can enjoy life. So this is where it gets better. But on top of that, the best thing about why we are Seventh day Adventist Christians is that we have something to look forward to when Jesus comes again. I'm going to fire you five Bible verses quickly. And they shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. Behold, He is coming with clouds and every eye will see Him. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice. And Jesus makes this wonderful 
wonderful, wonderful promise in John chapter 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It's the ultimate reunion. You think you have it good here now, and some of us do. It's going to be even better. The Bible says, One of my favorite passages. So when this uh, corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? And the final, final book of Revelation has this to say. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying, there shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. That's what we're remembering today. We're proclaiming the fact that we have hope. And for some of us, if things are going quite well, some of us, Not so much. But we have hope. And that is worthy of a celebration. To summarize the second coming, here it is. Fundamental number 25, I think it was. The second coming of Christ is the blessed hope of the church. This is on our Adventist website. The grand climax of the gospel. The Savior's coming will be literal, personal, visible, and worldwide. When he returns, the righteous dead will be resurrected, and together with the righteous living will be glorified and taken to heaven. But the unrighteous will die. The almost complete fulfillment of most lines of prophecy, together with the present condition of the world, indicates that Christ's coming is near. The time of that event has not been revealed, and we are therefore exhorted, exhorted to be ready at all times. Why do we celebrate communion? Paul's exhortation in the context of communion is simply this. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that is why we celebrate. I'm going to close with a four-minute video. Four and a half minutes, actually. And then we'll have our communion, and I'll explain what that is. Um, if you're not comfortable, if you want to just watch, that's fine. But if you accept and believe what Jesus has done for us on the cross, um, join us. But before I do the video, let me just preface it by saying this. The world, many have likened it to a battlefield. You know, Sometimes we're at peace, we have nothing to worry about. Sometimes we have to go to war because of health, because of a number of things. Sometimes we lose our loved ones. We have to say goodbye. This video is a very human approach to, I guess, giving us a glimpse of what it will be like when the end of the world comes, when we are reunited with our loved ones. I believe it's not just an intellectual thing, but I believe it will be an emotional one.
Was cutting onions, please stop. <laughs> Whatever you feel like right now, through the difficulties and challenges you're going through, know that we have something to celebrate and to look forward to. The devil wants us to think that leaving this world is a bad thing, but it's not. Final words of the entire Bible. He who testifies to these things say, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus.